All right, Alexander, let's discuss the uh, force majeure from Gazprom. Now, um, we've done a lot of videos in the past when this all got underway, the economic war of attrition, the special military operation, and even before that, when all the, the troubles started between uh, the EU, Russia, Nord Stream 2, all of those things. And we noted that uh, sooner or later, Russia, Gazprom, would start winding down their, uh, their long-term gas contracts to Europe, to the European Union. They wouldn't cut it off right away, but they would find excuses. And eventually, over time, they would, act, they would shift towards, towards the east, towards China, and they would just wind those contracts down and wind that supply down. And now we have this force majeure statement. A lot of it is also connected to to Canada and Germany and these turbines, which a, a month, a month and a half, and they haven't been able to to solve this turbine thing. Really, this is it's unbelievable when you think about it. Anyway, what do you make of everything that's uh, that's happening? I think we're at the moment of truth. Actually, I think this is the moment when the remaining illusions that the Western leaders have uh, uh, been living under for the last couple of years and especially for the last couple of months since they launched that sanctions war, are going to come crashing down to earth. Because uh, what we have is, let's be straightforward about this, an utterly catastrophic energy situation in Europe, to, to a lesser extent, but also to a great extent in the United States. Maybe in the United States it's a disaster. In Europe it's a catastrophe. That's, that's if you like, the difference. Now... We have this decision from Gazprom, but note that it comes directly after Biden goes cap in hand to the Saudis. We're told all the time he's not really going to discuss oil. It's not about getting the Saudis to improve, increase oil output. Of course, that's exactly what it was. That's exactly why he went there. And he comes, he sees MBS, he said he wouldn't meet MBS, he he's, shakes MBS's hand, he said he wouldn't shake MBS's hand, he, he does all of these things, and what does he come away with? He comes away with nothing. <laughs> the Saudis say, well, we have a capacity to increase production to 13 million do uh, barrels a day, but actually, we're not actually thinking of doing it. <laughs> so, I mean, e even 13 million barrels a day is nowhere near enough. But whatever it was, the Saudis are saying no. And I think that, that was a shock. And we've seen over the last couple of hours, oil prices rise. So energy, that's, that's a major problem on the oil front. But it's massively overshadowed by the crisis in natural gas. Because you remember... Robert Habeck, the German economics minister, telling us that he'd found the solution. Germany wouldn't need Russian natural gas by the end of this year, that he'd sorted it all out. He'd spoken to Qatar and they were going to provide LNG. America was going to provide LNG. None of that is true. None of that has happened. LNG supplies from the US, as I understand it, and now from this point on, going to start to fall because the US needs that LNG for itself. Qatar isn't supplying the, the amounts that um, Habeck imagined they would. They never committed themselves to. And there isn't any way the facilities to process LNG. So they need Russian gas. And the Russians are doing exactly what we said. They're winding down the contracts. They're saying, look, we are, we're not wanted in Europe. we got customers elsewhere. We've got big customers in China. We're in the process of arguing things out with the Indians. <laughs> the Indians want us to build a pipeline. Initially, we've said no, but, you know, we're prepared to think about it. India is now investing in our LNG facilities in Sakhalin Island in replacement for Japan. We are not going to waste any more time with you in Europe. And Europe is desperately unprepared. It's uh, going through a heat wave at the moment. We're feeling it badly here in Britain. That means electricity supply power is now rising. Electricity consumption is rising. We have all those air conditioners whirring away. That needs power. Uh, the result is 
that gas is being taken out of the gas reserves instead of being increased, we are looking at a major crisis in Europe this winter. And you can tell that the leaders are now starting to panic because they start striking notes of defiance. So we have Olaf Scholz coming along saying, you know, we're going to keep on with our sanctions until Ukraine achieves victory, How, uh, which Ukraine will define what that victory is. When leaders start to talk in that way, it's invariably a sign that they have their back to the wall. And that's why they're coming out with these defiant statements, because they're trying as much to convince themselves as their audience. Is that the reason? Um, I mean, I, I, I can see I, I can see what you're getting at with that. Um, Borrell also came out with a statement um, the other day, and he said that uh, European citizens need to be patient because the sanctions are indeed working or are going to work. And uh, Russia just hasn't felt the pain of those sanctions just yet. But Borrell is very confident that, you know, give it three, six, nine months, maybe two, three, four years, you know, Russia and Putin, they're going to feel the effects of these devastating sanctions. That's literally what Borrell said. So my question to you is, you know, it seems that we always come back full circle to this million dollar question. Schultz is saying that uh, the EU is not backing down until victory is achieved by Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine came out with a statement. I believe uh, Kaluba, the foreign minister, came out with a statement, said we are not surrendering. We are not going to negotiate until Russia is defeated on the battlefield. Borrell, with his statements, are these leaders in Europe, are they stupid are they dumb? Are they blinded? Are they living in a bubble? Or is this intentional? Are they actually trying to crash the EU economy? Is the US trying to crash the EU economy in order to make it a subservient puppet satellite to the US? Or is it a combination of both? I mean, we always come back yeah. Yeah. to this question because it's almost hard to believe that they're committing this kind of suicide you know, without your mind going to, 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 to the two questions, are they dumb or is this intentional? Because I can't figure out why they're doing this. And, and just real quickly, Alexander, you mentioned Biden and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia giving him nothing. Saudi Arabia turning to BRICS, uh, Russia and India, power of Siberia, one, power of Siberia, two, power of Siberia, three, uh, the Russian economy. They're coming out with statements saying that uh, they're very bullish on the uh, economy in Russia. I mean, all the signs are pointing to a, a flat out victory in this economic war of attrition. The, uh, how do we answer this question? How do we answer we this we, question we can't, we can't, as to can't. why Europe is doing this? We can't conclusively answer this question. I mean, we, we, I mean, the, the, there is always a possibility. I think this is probably more true in the US than it is in Europe. But there is always a possibility that there are some people who are saying to themselves, let's crash everything and because we're going to come out the winners. Of course, if they do that, I mean, they have to bear in mind that the people who are more likely to come out the winners is not them. <laughs> the way things are going, it's going to be the Russians... Definitely. The Chinese and Indians, possibly. But, you know, they, they may be they, they may have this game plan theory, which is which they're still sticking to. They may say, you know, if everything smashes, if everything in Europe goes, especially goes smash. We can rebuild it. We can rebuild it as we want. We can, for example, centralize energy supply in the European Commission. That will get us even closer to this centralized uh, um, planned super state of our dreams. We're going to then press on and replace fossil fuels with hydrogen, which we can centralize even more. This will give us our tremendous technocratic control of everybody. You know, I'm not at all excluding that there are people within the Commission, perhaps to some the European Commission, who think in that kind of way. Uh, and within the governing classes who think in that kind of way too. But I have to say, I think it's also something else. I think it's an inability to accept reality. These are people 
who right up to a few months ago, the leaders of the West, still believed themselves to be the masters of the universe. And for them to face up to the fact that they're not is more that they can bring themselves to do. So, like a certain Austrian gentleman, whose name I'm not going to give, who was camped out in Berlin uh, in the mid-1940s, um, they continue to claim that victory is round the corner, even as, you know, the enemy's armies um, press around them. And, you know, as to that Austrian gentleman... Many people have called him many things, but very few people have ever said he was a fool. So, you know, it's not necessarily stupidity. It is delusion. It's an inability to face reality because the reality is so discordant with your ideological and inner beliefs that doing it is just too shattering to face. So you say to yourself that, you know, Russia is a bluff, it's a paper tiger, it's a house of cards. All we have to do is to wait just a little longer. That uh, uh, particular gentleman I spoke about, he also told his generals, it's a documented fact, that the uh, Red Army on the gates of Berlin was the greatest bluff since Genghis Khan. <laughs> Those are his actual words. So, you know, you know they, they maybe think that it may be that that kind of mindset has taken over. But, you know, it's not, the t uh, to come back to your other question, these two things are not contradictory. There may be people in Brussels, Berlin, London, Washington, who understand what's going on and think that they can, uh, uh, you know, that they can, you know, ride the wave uh, and reshape Europe and the US and perhaps the world as a result of this disaster. And, you know, they, may, they can be very intelligent people and they may be getting their calculations utterly wrong, but some people love their calculations and they might want to cling to them. But, I mean, delusion and fantasy and belief in magic <laughs> can also take over when people find themselves confronting with confronted by realities that they never imagined. Okay, a couple of quick questions. Number one, um, is Russia finally starting to retaliate on an economic level? And are they turning the pain dial up slowly, slowly? I mean, are they, are they sensing, you know, this is our time to really sink Europe? Yes, is the short answer. I think they are. I think that we've now reached that point. We're now... Uh, midway through summer, remember, winter isn't far away. Uh, winter's closer than we think. This is the moment when they're going to start making their big moves. Putin just said a short while ago, if you, you know, delay negotiating with us for much longer, you'll find negotiating with us becomes harder and harder. And we haven't even started in earnest yet. Those were his words. My sense is, and I, I'm reading the things all the time from, you know, what's going on the battlefields, that the Russians are, about, are, are, are slowly building up their forces and assembling them. And what's going to happen over the next few weeks in Ukraine on the military side is going to be very big. And I get the, same, the sense that the same is going to happen on the economic front, that we're going to have a massive push on the military side, and a knockout blow, or as the Russians see it, uh, a knockout blow on the economic front as well. And yes, they've been pulling up the dial ever so gently up till now. But I think we could very well be very soon in a position where that dial is suddenly turned full way. We have the gas cut off, we have cutoffs for all sorts of other things. And then, of course, <laughs> Mr. Schultz. And Monsieur Macron, who's also making similar ludicrous statements, um, are, 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 are going to be, and Ursula, your friend, <laughs> are going to be faced with the problems that we've been talking about. Notice that perhaps the cleverest of them, Mario Draghi, is trying to bail out. He's trying to resign, <laughs> and they won't let him, but he's clearly trying to bail out. Yeah, uh, Macron is going to also host the UAE once again to try and find uh, uh, other gas substitutes. Anyway, um, 
Do you think that, and I'm being a little cynical here, I'm not saying this is the case, but I'm just saying, do you think that Russia, the Kremlin, deliberately took things slow with regards to the special military operation, not retaliating, knowing that the European Union, the collective West, would act in a hysterical manner, or seeing in the beginning that they were acting in such a hysterical manner, they said, you know what, let's take our time, let them shoot each other in a circular firing squad, we're in no rush, let's take it slow and just let four, five, six months play out and watch that they're going to, watch them sink their own economies without, a, without us really doing much of anything. Do you think they kind of noticed that or planned that or saw that along the way and they said, this is interesting that they're actually doing this, taking these, action, these, these sanction actions against us which are going to boomerang and hit them so we can just kind of sit back. No need to, to rush things and just let them keep on, keep on moving towards the cliff. I think that the Russians... Um, worked out every possibility. I think they've been game planning this for a very long time. I think they've thought through everything, every possible angle. I mean, it's known that they have some extremely good theorists and analysts in their, in, you know, in their various departments, and I think they've planned it all, and I think they've worked it out very carefully. And I think the military operation, um, the fact that it's gone slow, um, has worked out perfectly for them. It's, it's weakened the West. You can see it. You can see intelligent people and good people. I mean, I mean, good people, ethically good people, like Daniel Davis, saying, you know, that protracting, prolonging this war is going to be an utter disaster for us. And I think the Russians understand, understand that very well and are working increasingly to that purpose. Now, whether they actually had that plan right at the beginning or whether that plan has evolved over time i don't know i i genuinely truly don't know i don't I, think we can possibly i always think of judo I, you know yeah. like using your, the yeah. weight of your opponent uh, uh, yeah go, go ahead yeah i was going to say but i you know that that this what i was simply going to say is that this thing looks as if it's been carefully prepared and thought through and um you know they have a massive intelligence apparatus in Moscow and it obviously works a lot better than ours by the way that they know how deluded the West was about Russia's own resources and its resilience they know that so you know I, I think it's quite likely that they said to themselves we don't quite know what the West is going to do but it's quite likely they will do this and as you uh, using the judo by the way uh, point is excellent you know, we'll let them destroy themselves uh, 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 and, you know, turn their own weight against them. And that's how it's looking. Yeah, okay, uh, a couple more questions. Um, do you believe that countries outside of the collective West now smell blood in the water? Do you know what I mean? Like Saudi Arabia, Iran, India, China... Uh, countries in South America as well. Do you think they're, they're finally sensing, you know what, this is our time as well to finally get out of this system that has held us down, to stick it to, to the Europeans, to, to, to stick it to, to, to Biden and the Biden White House and, and just kind of um, get out of the U.S. dollar system, you know, maybe forge a new future and, and to get out of the the architecture that has been ruling over us for so long. Do you think they kind of smell, they sense, about, and they sense an opportunity, an opening to, uh, yeah. to get out of the... I think yeah, I, I, yeah. abso absolutely, I definitely do. And I think that's one of the great events of this. It's absolutely clear now how across the world, outside the collective West, people have got completely fed up with the you know, the pomposity, the pretentiousness, the arrogance, the, uh, uh, you know, the sort of finger pointing and lecturing and moralizing of the Western powers and the way in which they've been carrying, around, uh, carrying on uh, around the world, you know, launching wars, imposing sanctions, telling people you should do this and you should do that. 
Uh, and you're absolutely right. I think they do send blood. And look at the way the mood has shifted. When the war began, you saw all those countries going to the United Nations. Some of them held back, but most, many, many countries voted with the West to condemn what Russia is doing. And now we see at the G20 that even many of those countries are now reassessing their positions and are increasingly distancing themselves from the West and are becoming more critical and more obviously and openly sympathetic to the Russians. Because deep, deep down, they all know why this war has happened. They know about the history of broken promises. They know how uh, uh, um, some people wanted to use Ukraine in a certain way to weaken Russia. They know all of these things. And at the same time, they are exasperated with the West and they are quietly rooting for the Russians. And it's not just we who are saying this. More and more people, interestingly, in the West itself are saying this. And there's been an extraordinary speech by, you name him, Tony Blair of all people, also saying we are now in a multipolar system or a bipolar system. The other side has more resources than us. And that's the first time this has ever happened. And we've lost traction and influence in the global south and you can smell the alarm the, the the shock in london in paris in berlin above all in washington that the friends that they thought they had have turned out not to be real friends at all they were they were uh, uh, subordinates and vassals and beneath it all there was seething resentments which are now starting to come up to the surface. Yeah, you saw that with MBS and Biden. But um, final question, uh, what will it take for a Sri Lanka, or is it even possible for a Sri Lanka moment to, uh, to happen or to arrive in, uh, in Europe? A lot of people say it'll never happen in the EU, and I'm not saying it has to be the same thing. I'm not saying it has to be the you know, copy-paste, but something along the lines where the people actually say enough. We're starving, we've gotten poor, we have no energy, we have no fuel, I can't live like this anymore. Is that possible? Uh, could it happen? What exactly will it take for uh, an, a European country, a Western country, to actually uh, have its people rise up and say, okay, this is, this is enough, we need a change, a big change in government? Yes, when people say something can never happen, it usually does. <laughs> there is an iron law of politics and history. So when people say hyperinflation in the West is impossible or an economic depression in the West is impossible or a currency debasement in the West is impossible, all of those things have happened in the past. They can happen again. When people say popular uprisings in the West are impossible, well, again, they've happened in the past. They can happen again. Of course they can. Now, that's not a prediction that's not to say that they will happen, but already you see more and more protests, more and more strikes. We're now in a major strike wave brewing in Britain. We've had railway workers, now we have uh, lawyers, we're going to have many others as well, because people's uh, uh, living standards are falling and falling fast. And there's a debt crisis. I don't mean a, a debt crisis in terms of government. I mean a personal debt crisis. People can't pay their bills. They can't pay their uh, household expenses. They're running short of basic things. It's not yet reached that point where it's become impossible, but it could very well do. What form will it take? That is very difficult to say. It may vary from one country to another. Say, in Italy, we might start to see sit-ins in factories, occupations of factories. That's a tradition in, in Italy. That used to happen in Italy. In France, we could see massive protests, people coming out, trying to storm buildings, that kind of thing. We saw that in 1968. That's the tradition in France. In Britain, it could be a strike wave by public sector workers. In Germany, it could be mass lockouts by uh, German employers, which result in a collapse in tax revenue. 
which triggers uh, a hyperinflation crisis like the one that we saw in Germany in the 1920s. So, you know, I, I, I'm not saying any of these things are going to happen in any one place, but it may be a combination of all of them. And each country has its own traditions of protest, of, uh, um, you know, disagreement, uh, 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 you know, people of uprising, and we could start to see manifestations of all of them. Remember, when Schultz, Borrell, Macron are telling us we've only got to hold out for a little longer because, you know, we're, we're going to win, it's a sign that they're coming under criticism and pressure in private. Um, Borrell confirmed that there's been disputes in the European Council about whether sanctions against Russia are working at all. He's admitted it. So already you can see that there's arguments starting to rage, recriminations. There's probably arguments within governments, and there's arguments already between governments and employers, uh, uh, trade unions, all kinds of things. And, of course, it's entirely possible that it could all come together in a massive protest wave. And when it does, well, we shall see. If it does, we shall see. Remember always that the other side also, of course, has massive instruments of control. And another sign that things may be getting very, very tense and that the pressure cooker is, that the pressure in the cooker is rising, is if we start to see those mechanisms of control uh, being uh, tightened. And that, of course, might create even more pressure in the cooker than what there would otherwise be. Yeah, I have a feeling that the protests in uh, in the Netherlands are just the beginning of, yeah, absolutely. of many. And I've also been reading a lot of tension between even Poland and Germany. You know, I've been hearing that that, that, that the Poles have almost, they, they almost have a resentment towards Germany in that they feel that they may have been pushed to the forefront of this uh, this sanctions war with Russia. I mean, you're starting to see a lot of resentment dynamics. The knives are being pulled out, and uh, everyone is kind of like, you know, if this ship is sinking, you know, it wasn't it wasn't my fault. I'm I'm bailing on this. You know, Draghi in Italy. You're starting to see a lot of these things start to creep up. Absolutely. Well, can I just say what they need to do is to is to start behaving like the grown ups tend to be. Admit come out and admit openly that they were in the, in the wrong uh, uh, um, and try to seek a negotiated settlement of this crisis um, whilst that option is still there. If they don't, then, you know, within weeks, the Russians will be on the Nepa. Within months, they will be further west still. They'll be in the, in the Carpathians. And in the meantime, of course, the energy crisis will get and the food crisis and all of these other crises will get far, far worse. And then, of course, the recriminations will be bigger still and the arguments will be bigger still and we will be in an even worse mess than the one we are in now. All right, we will leave it there. TheDuran.Locals.com Check us out on Telegram as well. Link down below. And The Duran Shop, 10% off. Use the code GOODDAY. Take care.